don't know if anybody of you have been at the TSA meeting uh, 2010 when uh, Casey Butman really gave an extremely comprehensive talk about aggression in TS. And uh, I must admit I only uh, saw the talk in the internet and uh, that were 77 slides and I think you probably would kill me if I showed you 77 slides tonight. Um, so it will be much briefer, I hope. And actually, um, my special thanks go to Dania Katt because she made me interested in the subject. Um, we wrote a chapter uh, about psychiatric comorbidities in this wonderful, otherwise wonderful book, a uh, wonderful book uh, from um, Jim Leckman and Davide Martino. And uh, so I got interested in learning disabilities and rage attacks. And uh, when I prepared this talk, I looked, of course, in the, in the literature and um, the last papers about aggression and rage attacks in PubMed are from 2013. So that's more than two, or these are two years ago. And I just wanted to, yeah, get a little bit awareness to this important subject. And because I asked the question to Ellen, um, were there other um, clinical aspects, um, other improvements, behavior improvements after um, this kind of therapy? Um, because my very subjective uh, impression is that premonitory urge might contribute to anger and rage attack um, in the subjects. So very briefly, what is it? What are the rage attacks? Some psychodynamic aspects, what I think might contribute, some clinical aspects, and then conclusions. So it is often, yeah, the lifetime prevalence of explosive outbursts in the general uh, population is about 5%. In Tourette's, among the clinically referred samples, um, 20 to 40 percent of the families of the kids suffer from rage attacks. And uh, if you look at anger control problems in general, increased irritability, um, the prevalence goes even up to 70 percent. Um, as I mentioned, Casey Butman, she's really much more into this field than I am, and uh, she published several publi uh, studies about that. And uh, in the different population, it was a little bit inconclusive um, if there is a sex difference concerning rage attacks. Of course, we know that in the clinically re referred samples, um, much more boys um, in our specialized outpatient clinic, we have even an, a quote from, from seven to one, um, many more boys. And um, only in this um, international consortium, uh, there was clear cut also a preponderance that the um, boys were more affected from anger problems, from rage attacks than the girls were. So that is nothing new to everybody here in the room. Um, that Tourette syndrome mostly not only ticks, but all these behavioral problems. Um, this kind of aggression problem, anger, um, rage attacks is not a diagnostic term, neither in ICD-10 nor in the new DSM-5. Um, sudden dramatic repetitive episodes, very important developmentally age inappropriate, and what the families often complain about, disproportionate to the trigger. Um, even more comprehensive description um, is here from Leslie Parker. Without warning, totally out of proportion um, and uncontrollable. Yeah. Um, just has to run the course and when it's over, it's over and uh, then the kids mostly regret um, that they got into it. So is it intermittent explosive disorder? Of course, there are some uh, overlaps. Um, the other new disorder, 
So this is again concerning in, in, in the DSM-5 now uh, aggressive outbursts, um, not better explained by another mental disorder. Of course, if we're dealing with Tourette, is this uh, underlying pathophysiological background, is it really distinct from tics? Um, or has it something to do with, with is there a common background? Um, is it mood dysregulation? Also there in the description, the overlap. Uh, but when I look at my patients, quite a few of the kids who are affected by rage attacks are not persistently irritable. What do we know? Or what can we think about? Um, you all heard very often today and yesterday about the CSTC circuit, that there are also some limbic parts uh, which are grossly disinhibited um, that might contribute to the rage attacks. And uh, when I got interested in, in this kind of aggression, um, I really thought, has it maybe something to do with depression, with emotional problems in the kids, um, with stress? That was also the reason why I asked about the premonitory urge. Um, there's one poster outside um, with some citations from the kids themselves, how annoying, how impairing uh, these premonitory urges are. So that might be a constant stress for the kids and yeah, increasement kind of hyper arousal as we, as we know it from, from a completely other disorder, the um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, this hyper arousal that might also contribute, contribute to those aggressive outbursts. Um, there is an overlap, as you can see here, between the brain areas, the circles um, that are involved in aggression, which are also involved in stress response, the two pictures on the left side, and which are also involved in depression and impaired reward processing. So what I thought besides or, or not besides or not versus these neurobiological backgrounds, there might be also of course the psychodynamic um, contribution. Yeah? Imagine the child um, that is under stress and we know that this premonitory urge um, is stress. Um, the tick severity increases, um, and that might lead to anxiety, frustration. I cannot control it. Can I control it? Am I supposed to control it? Um, this frustration also can lead to depression, and whoever deals with depressed patients know that they can be extremely dysphoric, that also depressed patients um, might tend to rage attacks, to explosive outbursts. And this, again, might lead to stress, of course, in the family, with the parents, with the teachers. And uh, then you have a cycle that we can hopefully interrupt by some interventions like this one Ellen just described. What I wondered, if it's a kind of, in parentheses, extra aggression. Yeah? In, in DSM-5, uh, we can distinguish now between this proactive instrumental um, part of aggression, the callous unemotional traits are explicitly mentioned. Um, we have this hot aggression, reactive aggression, effective, defensive, of course, with an increased impulsivity. And what I tried to show with the light red and intense red, um, that rage attacks, which seems to be extremely impulsive, um, 
maybe there is this hyperarousal in the background um, and that we can speak of, of special Tourette's aggression. And there's, of course, a big question mark behind that. We know that in the clinical practice, we rarely see pure hot aggression, pure cold aggression. There's always, um, or in most cases, a overlap. And if we can look at TS aggression, if there's also an overlap, or even this way, um, we need a lot more studies in this field. Some clinical aspects, of course, um, also in our uh, outpatient clinic, uh, which I had in Ulm, uh, in Germany, uh, University of Ulm. Um, we have um, conduct disorder, ADHD, um, more than 50%, but also a depression. And uh, if I look at the outpatients, with conduct disorder, who do not come in, in the specialized TIC um, outpatient clinic, we only have about 4% um, who are also diagnosed with TICs. Then we just look briefly what the parents think. Um, as I mentioned, I, my hypothesis was that there might be an overlap with anxiety and depression, and uh, we looked at the CBCL that were filled in online. Unfortunately, only half of our parents filled it out online. And actually, I was a little bit disappointed when I saw that the overlap between the what the parents said is that the kids are higher aggressive and have higher scores in anxiety depression only 1%. So that isn't a real support for my hypothesis. But um, of course, there is, a, is also this one group, 10%, where the kids have ADHD problems, anxiety, uh, depression, and aggression. But nevertheless, um, also in our um, patient sample, aggression seems to be more triggered by ADHD problems than by the emotional factors. So I just wanted to very briefly remind of this problem because I know that's a huge burden in the families. Um, there are some common neurobiological underpinnings, aggression and depression, um, and there are a lot of open questions. Yeah, can we see a correlation between uh, premonitory urges and um, aggressive behavior? Um, this deficit in sensory motor gating, um, the lack in pre-pulse inhibition, um, can we find correlation there? Um, so just some ideas for future research. And what we will do in Ulm, um, we have the possibilities in two other U EU consortia, um, which will look into the different uh, kinds of aggressive behavior. And um, this is an international consortium um, for kids with conduct disorders. And in Ulm, we will compare kids with Tourette syndrome, with and without rage attacks, with these uh, kids with conduct disorders and uh, we have some funding so that we can do different techniques like functional MRI, anatomical MRI, DTI, and also MR spectroscopy, of course, uh, very comprehensive neuropsychological testing, and um, hopefully we can present at one of the next TSA meetings some of these results. Thank you very much for your attention, and I thank my patients for participating. We had uh, uh, some results about uh, aggression, and we will show them on Friday. But the, the strongest correlation between aggression and the comorbidities was with, with OCD symptoms and with ADHD. It was really strongly correlated. Yeah, this is what most studies show. And uh, also in our um, sample, patient sample, we saw the overlap um, between ADHD um, I must say, 
these were CBCL data, and um, the um, the part for OCD um, is increased in the CBCL as soon as the kids have ticks because it's also asked for ticks, and uh, so we we don't. Uh, that was a reason why we didn't look at the OCD part of the CBCL. I think we are looking at the iceberg of what we call complex Tourette. And we are looking at all those comorbid conditions, OCD, ADHD, aggression, whatever, uh, sensory modulation, etc. I think we have a problem with the basic concept of Tourette syndrome. We have inherited the, the definition by neurologists, and we try to apply it in psychiatry. And uh, it's... Uh, we define it purely with the ticks, while it's a lot of other things. I think we're facing a basic disorder of the brain. I agree it's a brain disorder, uh, where we have a lack of inhibition in many different layers and systems. And that's where, that's what it is. Yeah, thank you for that statement. I just can agree. and. Um, uh, you, you're right, it uh, doesn't make sense that we look into the different diagnoses and study autism and ADHD, the two other major neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and you mentioned the, 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 the domain research criteria and also the pharmaceutical companies, they go more into investigating the traits. Yeah? Um, anhedonia, um, impulsivity, um, aggressiveness, um, and there is an overlap between the diagnosis and um, to look more into those traits and f try to figure out uh, what is the pathophysiological background in those traits in autistic children, in children with TS, um, obviously makes much more sense. I can totally agree what you said. So the question is uh, about the disinhibition? Well, that, and, and you have a comment on, on the kids are almost always remorseful. I mean, I think that's a really important point that nobody talked about. Yeah, you're right, and we, 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 I really don't have an answer to that yet, uh, why that is so. Um, we, we, we have to look at it more carefully and uh, ask the kids about it, I guess and learn from themselves. Thank you. Ah. Together with all the imaging studies we do. Hello. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about uh, that there was no warning in front of a rage attack. And, um, well, myself, I don't recognize that because I do feel a warning now I'm getting older. And all the parents I talk to, they later on also say, like, in, at first they didn't see that warning, but later on they did recognize it, and I was wondering what your view on that was. Yeah, actually I, I have now some patients in, in the age of 18, 19, 20, and um, sometimes the parents say, okay, I can't tell in the morning when you're sitting at the breakfast table, um, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, In the small kids, it, it, it can be the fly on the wall, and uh, Maybe it has something to do with the maturation of the brain that there is in the older age, in, in the late adolescence, young adulthood, that there is um, yeah, a, a, a kind of better control by the prefrontal cortex so that there is this kind of warning later on. Yeah? And also this we have to study further on. Yeah. Thank you very much for everybody for staying and thank you Andrea.